All right. Thanks everyone for attending. It's uh, seven o'clock. Uh, really appreciate your time and hope everyone's uh, managing to avoid the heat as best as they can. This meeting will be recorded, uh, or this webinar will be recorded so that it can be viewed in the future, uh, recognizing a lot of people are busy today uh, and it's getting into the summer doldrum. So people are probably on vacation and finishing up uh, the school year. The objective of these webinars is to give you information to inform your advocacy work. Uh, you know, if we just pass this information on to you and you don't tell anybody or talk to anyone about it, it doesn't really do any of us any good. But if you're meeting with your MLAs and your MPs and you're using this information to help educate them and move things in a positive direction for fish, wildlife and habitat, uh, then this, this, the goal of this uh, webinar is, uh, will be successful. Uh, I'd like everybody to keep in mind that Dr. Ford is a researcher. He's not a policymaker. So if you feel your blood pressure rise, and you're getting really mad presentation, keep in mind that his job in all this is to present the science. Uh, our job is to do the advocacy piece. So if you have a question, try to frame it around the science um, as opposed to the policy end of things. And uh, we'll be keeping kind of the line of questioning around the world of science and uh, data as opposed to the world of policy. Um, in terms of the way things will go, there's a Q&A function. If you're on Facebook Live, you can put your questions right in the comments. If you're on Zoom, you can put your questions in the Q&A. We'll keep track of them. And at the end, we'll ask Dr. Ford. If there's similar questions, we'll kind of collate them and put them together so that we're not asking the same question multiple times. Um, so with that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Ford. Um, for all of you who haven't met him yet, uh, in two days, uh, Dr. Ford will graduate from an assistant to an associate professor at UBC. That's a big thing uh, in the world of uh, ac academia. He's currently the Canadian Research Chair in Wildlife Restoration Ecology. Prior to his work at UBC, he completed a Liberero postdoctoral fellowship with John Frixel in Guelph, working on the design of wildlife corridors in the Banff area. Ford's PhD work was on rangeland ecosystems in Kenya, where he studied how leopards, wild dogs, their alternate antelope, their antelope prey, and plants interact. Those are dick dicks, right? Dick dicks and impala. Okay. Yeah. His PhD research received several awards, including the Governor General's Gold Award, Gold Medal, and an American Association for the Advancement of Science Prize for Early Scientists. His earlier education included Carleton University, UVic, and Lethbridge College. Prior to becoming a professor, Ford was a researcher on the Banff Wildlife Crossing Project, an analyst for the Canadian Wildlife Service working on endangered prairie raptors, and conducted third-party reviews of environmental assessments for the energy sector in Alberta. Ford has co-authored over 75 peer-reviewed papers and several million dollars in grant funding. Ford's Advice is actively sought by managers and decision makers. He sits on a number of provincial committees, including the BC Hunting and Trapping Advisory Team, the BC Flinro Ministers Wildlife Advisory Council. Ford's research group of graduate students and postdocs in the Wildlife Restoration Ecology Lab works to restore important relationships in nature's food web, including those between people and wildlife. Some of his group's research includes studies involving mule deer, caribou, Roosevelt elk, mountain goats, wolf, bighorn sheep, bison, cougar, boreal caribou, and wolves, as well as studies on bear and human interaction, disease modeling, and policy analysis. Ford works closely with several First Nations, environmental groups, governments, and private sector companies to use evidence and cooperation in the restoration of natural systems and the people that depend on wild animals, plants, and spaces. Uh, just to mention as well, Dr. Ford is also one of the primary investigators for the Southern Interior Mule Deer Project, along with Dr. Sophie Gilbert from the University of Idaho. So he makes up um, half of our uh, primary our PI uh, on the project. So uh, he has the credentials, the experience, he's done the on the ground research, and tonight he's going to talk to us about road ecology. So Dr. Ford, thanks for coming, and it's all yours. Uh, thanks for that introduction, Jesse, and welcome to the talk tonight, everybody. Um, yeah, I'm excited to, uh, to, to come to you from Kelowna, from my nice, cool basement. 
and I hope you're keeping cool as well. Um, here speaking on Silk Okanagan Territory. And as Jesse said, I'm uh, from UBC. So <clears throat> what I want to talk to you today about is road ecology in the big picture and some of the lessons we learned from one of the world's sort of most famous and longest running road mitigation projects. And one of the reasons why this project uh, has the fame it does is because of the investment in monitoring. And that's one of the key sort of take home messages that I want you to think about as we keep talking today is um, it's one thing to have great ideas and it's one, one thing to have uh, interventions that are brave and bold. And it's another thing to make sure that we're keeping track of what's going on on the ground to know that the investments we're making in wildlife and habitat are uh, worthwhile. <clears throat> Go. So yeah, just to visualize where we're working as a group in the WIRE lab, the Wildlife Restoration Ecology Lab, it's mostly in Southern BC. Um, these are the, the critters we work on. I think Jesse did a great job of covering it, so I won't get into too much detail, but just know that uh, in all these studies, um, some of which you're going to hear about or have heard about, some of which you won't uh, uh, quite yet, but uh, roads are probably part of all of these. Uh, projects in some way. And in fact, you know, Jesse is mentioning, oh, I'm going to be an associate professor, which I don't think most people know what that means, but um, it's just a marker of where we are in, in the building of this research program in BC. And when I started this program, literally like three weeks into, into my job as a professor at UBCO, it was a bad weekend for badgers. 2% uh, of the badger population was killed that weekend. And one of those animals was killed right in front of, of UBCO campus. So this is Highway 97 in Kelowna, right by the airport. I took this photo. It was just uh, very odd to see such a rare and endangered species um, dead right in front of, of campus. And I think this was a reminder that even though <clears throat> I had kind of, you know, expanded my research portfolio here into British Columbia, that of course these issues are really important everywhere we go. Yeah, and roads are a part of humanity. It's hard to imagine roads and people separate, right? So roads have been part of the Roman Empire. The, the, they're part of indigenous cultures in North America and, and around the world. The footprint or use of those roads is still occurring today. There's, you can walk on Roman roads in, in Europe. Uh, you can go to the Anasazi roads in the Chaco Canyon and still see them as you can in this photo. So roads are something that are part of us. Um, we use them almost every day, uh, unless you're a basement dweller like me, but you're on a road almost every day. Um, they're connecting us to our community, to each other, to our work, to our food and our water. Uh, roads are part of life. And there's different kinds of roads, of course. So we have you know, your typical urban road, which is what probably most people interact with on a daily basis. Um, the urban roads are, you know, clustered in a small area, they have high traffic, typically slower speed, and they don't really have a big impact on the uh, habitat around them because the habitat's already not there because it's an urban area. So they're dense but kind of confined. And then we have highways, which have high traffic volume, so they're moving a lot of cars through, uh, through a small space. They're very wide. These can occur in good habitat, as in this photo but they're typically fairly sparse. So there's a low density of these. And then we have resource roads, which are, have low traffic volume. They're narrow, they're usually unpaved. And in a place like British Columbia, as I'll show you later, they are ubiquitous. They're almost everywhere. And indeed roads are everywhere in the world. There's a, an estimate of 21 million kilometers worth of roads right now, and an estimated three to almost 5 million kilometers of new roads added to the earth uh, by the year 2050. So uh, whatever we understand and know about roads, we need to know more about them because they're going to be more uh, a bigger a bigger part of the earth as a, uh, in the near future. And it's not just that there's more roads somewhere, but it's where these roads are being built. So this is from a study we published earlier uh, last year. Uh, looking at how road expansion in 
uh, tiger landscapes could affect tiger viability. So each one of these colored blobs on this map is an area that the host country has sort of dedicated to prioritize tiger conservation. And you can see that some of those areas vary quite a bit in road density, the darker areas or redder areas have higher road density. But there's a, there's a lot of effort. There's a policy initiative from China called the Belt and Road Initiative and, and other road expansion projects around the world that want to expand roads. And we're seeing upwards of a 50% increase in the roads within those tiger conservation landscapes. So this suggests that even in areas that people are setting aside for one of the most charismatic and important you know, wildlife species that we can think of in the world, uh, roads are still part of the footprint. And the difference or the, the, the similarities to what's going on in British Columbia are very clear. Um, a 2017 Auditor General's report suggested that there are 10,000 kilometers worth of new roads being built each year in this province. We don't have a good handle on where all those roads are. It's another question for, for maybe another day. We're trying to figure that out. Um, but roads are part of the BC story too, of course. Um, so this is from a study uh, on Highway 3 in the Crow's Nest Pass, so just on the uh, other side of the BC-Alberta border. And you can see that roadkill is increasing with time. So we're, we know that the roads themselves are increasing, but we also know that in some places, the impact of roads on wildlife and human safety could be increasing as well. It's a little ambiguous because if you get more roadkill, it could mean that the wildlife population is increasing as well. If if it's sort of a fixed rate, or it could mean that the, the wildlife population is decreasing as more and more mortalities are being caused by, by roads and, and traffic. So this doesn't tell us much about the impact of roads on the population per se, but it is definitely a problem to have a growing number of uh, road kills. So in the big picture, there are a number of problems that roads bring to habitat and for wildlife. Um, they can contaminate the land, they can spread weeds, uh, they can impede uh, hydrology. Um, there's a lot of these sort of abiotic drivers and, and plant-based drivers, but today I'm going to talk to you about these bottom four, uh, about how roads affect movement of wildlife, how animals are killed by wildlife, and how we understand patterns of mortality from, from roads. Um, these specific kind of contexts or conditions that make some species or some areas more susceptible to road effects than others, and this idea of the road effect zone. And that is basically the impact of the road on the landscape is bigger than the footprint of the road, but it extends out into the surrounding landscape. So the impact of these different road effects on nature really depend on things that I sort of mentioned earlier, like the width of the road, its surface type. You know, is it impervious or pervious to water? the amount of cars on the road, uh, the speed at which those cars are traveling, the density of roads in the landscape, what condition is the adjacent habitat in near the road, and what's going on with the local wildlife population. So these are sort of the, sort of jump around here, but these are sort of the main ones for the talk today. And we're gonna begin with one of the most important charismatic species in North America, the Eastern Chipmunk, when I say that tongue-in-cheek, but obviously chipmunks are a great model organism to understand how small creatures can interact with the road um, because they're easy to manipulate and you can keep track of them pretty easily. So this is actually from my master's work, but basically what we did is translocated a bunch of chipmunks, dropped them off near the road, uh, that's where that little star is, and then tracked these little chipmunks near the road with, uh, the, we fit them with little backpacks that had string in them, so we come back the next day after dropping them off and follow the string and trace out their pathway. And it was something like 68 chipmunks, six kilometers worth of tracking string and only two animals crossed the road. And what we're trying to do is figure out if traffic volume affected the probability that a chipmunk would cross the road. And, uh, and yeah, it doesn't. Uh, but animals, these animals are reluctant to cross the road irrespective of the amount of traffic on the road. So. Traffic is a part of it, but the road itself can be a barrier to a lot of animals. We also summarized some data from a lot of different studies, eight studies starting with publications that came out in 1935 uh, up to 2000, up to 
the year 2000 where people would just drive around and count roadkill. So like those 1935 studies were actually pretty rigorous. You can imagine somebody driving around in a Model T, right? And they just counted all the roadkill they found on the roads in, uh, in the US someplace. And um, it, it counts as data and it was rigorous enough. So we pooled all those data and looked at the body sizes of the animals that they're finding in those surveys. and found that there's sort of a sweet spot of an animal that is abundant enough to show up in uh, a roadkill survey, which tend to be the smaller animals, but also large enough to get hit uh, by a car and, and be detected by a driver. And that's where this sort of sweet spot is around one kilo. So that's things like hares and rabbits. So different animals have different vulnerabilities to roadkill. And roadkill has a different sort of selective pressure too on wildlife. So Here's a study from Banff uh, that's in the works right now with our group. And what we're looking at here is the sort of body condition at, at the time of death when these animals were found. And the green bars show animals that were killed by predators, typically wolves and cougars. And the dark blue bars show um, animals that were killed on the highway. And you can see that across most seasons, uh, animals that were killed on the highway were in better body condition than the ones that were uh, killed by predators. So what this kind of means is um, we know that individual body condition can affect the trajectory of a population. So healthier animals are going to survive and reproduce better than unhealthy animals. And this means that an animal killed by a car could have a bigger impact on the population than an animal killed by a wolf or another natural predator. So keep that, keep that in mind as we're thinking about what are the drivers of populations as a whole. Yeah, and roads are some, they're a novel thing for animals in terms of their evolutionary history. So some animals don't really respond in an optimal way uh, to roads. So we that was participated in a study where again, we translocated animals, uh, dropped them off at the edge of roads and then watched them cross the road just, with, just by watching them. So these are leopard frogs and um, the control areas on the far left, this bar on the far left here, uh, were areas off the road, and then we had low traffic sites and high traffic sites. And if you were uh, faced with crossing a road that had high traffic on it, you would want to get off that road as soon as possible, but that's not what frogs do. They freeze up, you know, if there's something coming, like their response is to hide or, or to, to pause to, uh, you know, be more cryptic. But on a road, that's probably not the best approach. So animals that, uh, that don't have that optimal response are, again, perhaps more vulnerable to road mortality and other road effects than animals that are um, quicker or have a different type of response. So, and then I just wanna to touch on this idea of a road effect zone. So this is an old paper, uh, 42 years old, uh, by Rose and Bailey in Journal of Wildlife Management. And they counted uh, uh, deer pellets near and away from the road. And they found that as you get farther away from the road, you tend to see or encounter more sign of mule deer. And this kind of captures the idea of the road effect zone that uh, maybe these mule deer are avoiding the sight of cars or the sound or some other disturbance that's associated with the road. But the idea is that uh, they're not just avoiding the pavement, but they're avoiding this uh, swath of land around the road. And then when we look at the combined effects of roads, you can, you can imagine an effect of road density at the landscape scale or population level. And uh, Clayton Lamb, who some of you may be familiar with, published a study in 2017 with some colleagues um, looking at the effects of road density on grizzly bear density. And below sort of a management recommendation of 0.6 kilometers per kilometer squared of road, there was a, a substantial difference in the number of grizzly bears in the landscape. So the bar on the left is, is that low road density uh, uh, location and the bar on the right is the uh, higher road density locations. So what is the mechanism there? You know, is it uh, human wildlife conflict? Is it harvest pressure? Is it disturbance from the road itself? Habitat degradation that is, that is associated with higher road density sites? All these things can combine together to affect roads. And so thinking of roads as, a, as an index or a, a proxy or some other way of measuring sort of like a number of uh, the human disturbance processes is a, is a way of sort of bundling up our understanding of the impact of people on wildlife. So 
that's sort of the bad news of roads. Um, what can we sort of learn about how to manage roads as a as a problem for wildlife and habitat, and an opportunity to restore the movement and in ecological processes associated with wildlife. And that's where Banff comes in. So I'll run through the background of how we got to uh, learn all this information about uh, roads from Banff and then get into some of the specific findings. And I wanna begin with uh, the champion of this project, uh, Dr. Tony Clevenger, who's based at the Western Transportation Institute uh, in Montana. He lives in Harvey Heights, uh, just uh, around the corner at the end of this picture here, um, near Canmore. And Tony, I think is just, it's worth mentioning that uh, these sorts of projects need a champion, right? And they need people that can navigate complex bureaucracies and can pool funding from different sources and can believe in the final vision. And I think, uh, yeah, we need to sort of find these people for the specific wildlife projects that we're uh, passionate about and make sure that they get the support they need to do their jobs. And what uh, Tony was able to do is bring management from Parks Canada and funding from other agencies from around the world and private donors um, and support a long-term wildlife monitoring program along the highway. And when the typical PhD project lasts five years, maybe three of those years are actual data collection, um, getting to something that's an 18 year monitoring project uh, is quite remarkable. So the study area that I'm referring to kind of extends from Camor out to the BC Alberta border along the Trans-Canada Highway. So it includes areas within and outside Banff National Park. Um, this is a kind of key connectivity area for the Wadawai region. Um, and yeah, all the species of, uh, all the large mammal species sort of in Western Canada tend to be found in this area, or at least Southern parts of Western Canada. So the, the Trans-Canada Highway in Banff started out as a, you know, like a lot of roads do, right? Like gravel, uh, like a resource road. Um, it expanded to a two lane road and still pretty low, uh, low traffic volume. And then uh, there was a lot of pressure as, as traffic increased on the Trans-Canada through the seventies to twin it. And with that, there was this risk of of collisions with elk. So the elk population in Banff at that point was booming. There were no wolves around. Um, and uh, they called this section of road between Camor and Banff uh, the, the meat grinder because there is a lot of uh, elk vehicle collisions. So that was like a big motivation to sort of understand, hey, if we're going to expand this road, if we're going to make, bring more people into the park and uh, increase the traffic volume, and, and uh, we're gonna increase the risk to both people and wildlife within the park. So we better figure out a way of reducing wildlife vehicle collisions. So the easy solution there, and at this time you have to appreciate how visionary this was, was to fence the highway. So they did that. And then oddly enough, they were concerned by fencing the highway between Camor and Banff that it would displace animals outside of the national park and onto the prov provincial land and create a problem for the town of Camor and surrounding areas. So trying to be good neighbors, Parks Canada said, hey, if we can relieve that sort of pressure on the fence and make the fence work better, but we should build some underpasses. So that's what they did. They didn't know which kind of design would work best. So they tried a few different designs. They tried to stagger some, um, they tried to make some really long ones. They had box culverts, some near creeks, um, some of these, yeah, elliptical culverts. And uh, at this point in the early stages, there were no overpasses. So it was a bit experimental. And part of that experimental design is really adaptive management, which is something that people often talk about, but rarely do. So here's that first phase of the Banff Town site in Camor. So this was built in the 80s, 12 underpasses. And then the focus again there was really on elk and uh, ungulate movement. Phase 3A was completed in the 90s. This is a 25 kilometer stretch. It had 10 underpasses. And these are where we get these first overpasses showing up uh, in Banff, these two big 50 meter wide uh, overpasses. And the focus there was much more on carnivores and in parks language, maintaining, maintaining ecological integrity. And then while we we're doing this phase 3A monitoring, phase 3B was being planned and built. 
And so the lessons from both phase one, two, and three A were informing the design and placement and, and monitoring plan for the structures along three B. And this is all pretty much completed now, as far as I know, right out to the BC border. So starting, yeah, in the late 90s, um, research began, monitoring began on these sites. Are they doing their job? And um, during the time that I worked on there and, and since and before, uh, several papers and proceedings and conference presentations have followed uh, to share this work. And that's part of why I'm coming to you today. So I'm just gonna cover some basic questions about what we learned from Banff. There was many more lessons that we did learn, but I just wanna to touch on some of the highlights. So the first is how do we even monitor mitigation um, and its effectiveness for uh, doing its job, which is reducing wildlife vehicle collisions and increasing uh, animal connectivity across the highway. How is, is our mitigation working? So does the fencing work to reduce uh, roadkill? Do wildlife crossing structures work? And then how does mitigation, fencing and crossing structures affect species interactions? So one of the first questions we tackled was how do you track wildlife at crossing structures? And when I showed up at the project, they were using these uh, dirt track pads. I'm gonna pull up my pen here, hopefully. Um, spotlight. There we go. So we had these dirt uh, track pads in the underpasses, which were great because there was a lid on the underpass, which was the road. So they were kind of climate controlled, right? Um, and then in the early days of the project, they had cameras set up at the overpasses because of course it's really hard to maintain a track pad in the weather conditions uh, on an overpass. Um, in the old days, they were you know slide-based remote cameras. So uh, every week someone would have to drive all the slide film from Banff into Calgary to get processed. And then they would have to wait for the film to get processed and then go back and count the pictures. So it's such a far cry from where we are now with camera trapping technology. But even back when I started, we got first generation Reconyx cameras. So these are housed in, in an old Pelican case. And there's a couple of those on the crossing structures. So while we we're tracking animals at the underpasses, we would note if there were too many tracks to count. And this can happen when a herd of elk comes through and just obliterates the tracks. It makes it hard to count how many elk there were, but it basically obliterates any other track that was on there at that time. So that's not a great monitoring uh, tool. But again, the idea with track pads is all you need is dirt and a rake. And we did break a lot of rakes, right? Hopping over the fence to go check the crossings. But, uh, you know, a $12 rake uh, every few months is, was pretty cheap compared to the cost of these uh, cameras at the time. So ultimately, we found that uh, when you factor in um, the cost of visiting uh, dirt track pad every couple days, so there weren't too many tracks, right? We flagged them as too many to count if there are too many uh, tracks to count. Um, uh, and compared that to the cost of servicing cameras every few weeks and then classifying the pictures, it was far cheaper to use camera traps when they were really expensive than it was to pay someone to visit a track pad and, uh, uh, and do the dirt raking thing every two to four days. So um, that was a good lesson in helping improve the efficiency of doing this work. And of course, now I think most people would just intuitively gravitate towards uh, camera trapping. But at that point, camera traps are so new, we had to demonstrate that. We also need to keep track of roadkill, right? If we want to know where things are dying from roads or not dying because of mitigation, we need to keep track of where they're dying and how often. So um, we did a study where we looked at monitoring um, with a road contractors, with the support of road contractors who were there to pick up the roadkill, right? Uh, they would keep track of where things were killed. And sometimes they would say, oh, it's you know two kilometers from such and such a bridge or it's between this mile marker post and that mile marker post. And we found uh, unsurprisingly that using a GPS, again, this is relatively novel at the time, but using a GPS to keep track of where the road kill uh, was happening is a very uh, important improvement to providing accurate uh, descriptions of where road kill was occurring. And I say that because there's a lot of legacy data out there and a lot of uh, uh, asystematic or haphazardly collected road kill data 
and it matters, right? It matters if we're talking about an accuracy that varies by a kilometer, whether, um, yeah. So if you're, if you're here to promote some better monitoring uh, and, and data collection for roadkill in British Columbia, um, let's try to find a way of integrating uh, spatially accurate GPS-based uh, locations when we're asking contractors to pick up roadkill. There's also citizen science approaches. So collaborators at the Mistakis Institute at Mount Royal are uh, participating in um, app design that is being used by people to keep track of roadkill. And that's something else that perhaps even the Wildlife Federation could look into. Um, there's people that are regularly driving certain stretches of road, and this would be a great way of keeping track of where the roadkill is. Okay, now, does mitigation work? We'll start with fencing. So, uh, here we have a record of uh, along the Trans-Canada Highway of annual uh, wildlife vehicle collisions, so upwards of 80. So this is a, a not a long stretch, 30 kilom uh, three kilometers. And then after fencing, there was an 84% decline in collisions. And most of these are uh, going to be carnivores, so coyotes and black bears are either get under or over the fence respectively. Um, but by and large, uh, the ungulates were kept out. So it's very effective. Now, why, why doesn't this happen everywhere? Well, one of the reasons is it costs money to build these fences, right? And uh, estimates around this time for Banff or when I was there was about $75 a meter for one side. So it gets really expensive. Uh, and that's the NUS funding back in the day. So, um, Marcel Voyager and, and colleagues in 2009 published a great paper that quantified the societal value or the societal impact of a vehicle collision for different species of wildlife. Um, this includes things like uh, injury to people, damage to property, to vehicles, and lost uh, wildlife viewing and hunting opportunities that these animals provide. Um, deer, the impact of deer is about 6,000, uh, 600 USD, but it goes up to almost $30,000. Uh, for a moose. So these collisions are expen expensive. I'm going to come back to how we can think about the economic benefits of fencing uh, in a few slides. Oh yeah, that's this one, sorry. So we looked at, um, so if you think about wildlife vehicle collisions happening in different parts of a highway, where do you want to put a fence and how big should that fence be? That was sort of the question we we're looking at because at this time there's a sort of an other road, if you're familiar with uh, Eastern BC, there's a road uh, past Radium that connects to um, Banff through Kootenai National Park. And at that point, it wasn't fenced at all. So we're thinking about how can we also learn lessons from uh, Banff National Park and apply them to other parks in the system. And so we simulated uh, different sections uh, of highway and move them around like a moving window on Highway 93 in Kootenai National Park and calculated the cost benefit ratio of those locations using existing roadkill data. And so this is, uh, this is me trying to do economics. So apologies to all the uh, uh, natural resource economists out there, but I was young. And so, uh, yeah, anyways, forgive me, but we're looking at a benefit ratio. So as you go above that line, um, it pays to build the fence because you're reducing that societal cost of that fence segment. Um, below that line, it's more expensive to build the fence. And so it's, I know the figure is in a, a great quality, um, but the, the general pattern here is that uh, short fence segments, two kilometers to 10 kilometers, are very efficient at capturing uh, a societal benefit of building a fence up to two times, right? The impact of that uh, uh, in savings um, from reducing collisions. The trade-off here, of course, is you need to have a very good estimate of where those collision hotspots are occurring. And you have to know that those hotspots are relatively stable. So in a park setting with really good data, that kind of makes sense. In areas where you have more dynamic landscapes that may affect animal movement, you may want to uh, mitigate the risk of uh, having an inaccurate fence placement by having a longer fence. But within that longer fence, know that there's going to be some sort of quieter spots that may not um, uh, be as if, uh, uh, where wildlife may not be willing to cross uh, anyways. Yeah. Okay, so one day we're out with some wildlife um, 
engine or sorry, some road engineers and looking at some of those new fence sections, the, some of the new fence, fence sections in Baptist National Park. And I asked if, um, well, actually, some of you may know this, but if you look at this, these page wire fences, especially in the Okanagan and, and places in the, in the Kootenays, um, you'll find that the mesh size is smaller, closer to the ground than at the top of the fence. And I'm not sure what that's about, but I wondered if it was uh, to keep small animals from crossing the, the fence. I don't know if it's, there's some other structural benefit, but I asked the engineer, hey, does this keep the little animals out? And he's like, that's your job. So I said, okay, that's our job. Uh, so we went in the winter and counted tiny animal tracks, like little shrews and weasels and whatnot to see if they were crossing the fence and if this variable mesh size had any effect at all on animal movement. And it was pretty cool to learn different sizes of tracks and different types of tracks anyways. Um, most animals, of course, if they could fit through the fence, they did. Like these animals are used to going in tight spaces to begin with. So no big surprise that most animals uh, cross the fence. Um, which tells us that, you know, maybe the variable mesh size design, if it's more expensive than a fixed mesh size, is maybe a, a place where we could get some cost savings. Um, and yeah, if animals can fit through the fence, they probably will, which is another sort of not terribly surprising conclusion. The other kind of cool thing, though, was uh, if there was a little under, like a little culvert under the road, which is what this dark spot is in the photo, um, so the, the pictures taken with the road at my back, uh, the animals would cross through the fence and then sort of gravitate towards the uh, culvert and that helped them cross the road. So if they use the culvert, they had a greater chance of crossing the road. Uh, the key is in the winter, at least, you have to keep this culvert uh, open. So if it's if the culvert opening is close to where the snowplow pushes the snow off the road, it's not going to get used by animals as much. And that's going to affect permeability and probably risk of collisions for those small animals. So uh, the engineering, the optimal engineering design would be to push this culvert entrance a little bit closer to the fence to get it away from the snowplow. Okay, so let's talk about crossing structures. So what makes a good wildlife crossing structure? Well, the answer to almost everything in ecology is it depends. Um, things like where does a crossing structure go? You want to put it in a place where animals are going to find it and use it. The type of crossing structure or the design, like we talked about underpasses and overpasses, that matters. Uh, we need to keep people out of them. So I'm going to cover that in a bit. But some, like, some of these crossing structures are uh, accessible to people and hikers. Uh, and in some places, like in the Okanagan, to motorists and cows. And then there's also species specific and even within a species, different um, sex and age classes that have preferences for different crossing structures. So there's a number of ways you could break down uh, the question, what makes a good wildlife crossing structure? So coming at you here with a lot of data uh, from 1996 to 2014, so almost 18 years of data, you know, thousands and thousands of records of crossing, crossing events um, by track pads and by cameras. And there's just, yeah, a number of papers and research, you know, ideas and questions from this. And that's still, believe it or not, being published and coming out. One of the ones that we're working on currently um, is a very sort of tight examination of overpasses versus underpasses. Now, why I mention that is because it's hard to do experimental research on wildlife crossing structures. Once you build them, you can't really move them around. It's not like Let's, yeah, let's take this underpass, plunk it two kilometers down the highway and see if it works better. Like once they're built, they're kind of there. So really the only opportunity we get to add some experimental control to these questions is to look for these opportunities like here where we've got an overpass right next to an underpass. And so these are within 200 meters of each other. So they're basically for these large animals, they have the same chance that an animal will encounter either one. And so we're controlling for the effect of the sort of surrounding habitat for the road design. So like as many things as possible that are the same for these two crossing structures are in place. It's just they're a different design. So now we can get into a sort of tighter understanding of what is the effect of the design per se on the probability of use uh, by these animals. So looking at grizzly bears here, uh, I'm just going to walk you through this figure. So we have years since construction on the x axis. And we have the predicted probability that an animal will prefer to use 
the underpass relative to the overpass. So if the uh, dots in the line, the, the lines here are the confidence intervals and the dots are the predicted response of the grizzly bears. So if we're below the pink line, it means that the grizzly bears prefer to use the overpass relative to the underpass. So what does that mean? Okay, so over time, look at here, years since construction, over time, you know, with the first really decade of research in this area or more, we would say to get grizzly bears across the road, you have to build overpasses, right? It's for a long time. But getting into more recent years, after a decade or so, so a couple generations of grizz, we're getting into more equal use of overpasses and underpasses. So I think this is a really important finding because it tells us one, you know, that these animals can adapt to different structure designs. Uh, maybe they're passed down from mom to cub or something. Maybe there's just a greater chance of encountering these uh, different structure types over time. But either way, the effectiveness of the underpasses seems to increase over time, which is great. Um, the other thing is we have this finding because of long-term monitoring. Again, this is like 16 years here and it's still going in some parts of Banff. So this is an important lesson to invest in long-term monitoring. And again, we found that cheaper method to do this. So the, the, um, the economic uh, and scientific benefits were there. Okay, the other yeah, another sort of question is what about people? So we have some crossing structures in Banff that are close to town and they're used regularly by hikers and others that aren't. And we found that there's species specific responses to the presence of people in these underpasses. So grizzly bears and cougars, unfortunately do not seem to avoid people. So they use crossing structures at the same time that people do. Now, this is kind of good if you, if you want to get these animals across the highway and, and you also want to get people across the highway. But it's bad if you're worried about um, facilitating a, a human wildlife conflict. So it would be better if everybody used them at a different time. Unfortunately, wolves and black bears tend to avoid using crossing structures that are used frequently by people. This is also bad because it basically makes the crossing structure less effective if people are using it. So you can't be, you can't have both. And so here we want to, yeah, the, the upshot here is to really keep people out of the crossing structure. It's called the wildlife crossing structure. Uh, leave it for leave it for the wildlife. I mentioned earlier that different uh, groups within a population may prefer different crossing structure types too. So here we looked at uh, individual grizzly bears and compared them to so probably uh, adult males and compared them to family groups, so mom with cubs. This is a, a messy figure, um, but the uh, the idea here is that the adult females and cubs tended to use uh, overpasses. This is like publishing before we were allowed to use color or something. I don't know why it's so hard, but anyways, these are this is the use of overpasses by family groups. Um, and then here is box culverts. Oh, sorry, this is uh, family groups. Uh, yeah, there's a tendency for them to use overpasses and then for the singletons to use overpasses, but a greater diversity of structures too. So basically the single uh, bears are generalists. They don't have a strong preference for crossing structure design, whereas the mom and cubs tend to prefer the overpasses. But animals used all these different structures at some point. And these structures vary quite a bit in their cost, right? So uh, an overpass is a few million bucks. A box culvert is, a, is like tens of thousands of dollars. And so this brings up this idea of well, is what's the best use of our money to get animals across the road, or at least to make the road as permeable as we can. And so if we assumed in the studies we did a fixed budget of let's say 5 million bucks, what are you going to do? Spend it all on overpasses and build two or uh, build 28 box culverts. And the model predicted that we could get more animals across the road by building more of these smaller, cheaper uh, uh, crossing structures that are maybe on an individual basis less effective, but as a system are uh, a better way of getting animals across the road uh, or a cheaper way of getting animals across the road. And within that, we know that uh, adult male bears, so these single bears may you know, uh, kill cubs. So if we can spread out where these different animals are using structures to get across the road, it could reduce uh, mortality rates and increase recruitment uh, within the population. 
Speaking of, do how do species interact at crossing structures? This question came up all the time on this research. Do the wolves just hide out in the underpass and wait for deer to come by and then they jump out and kill them? And it was always said with this idea that like carnivores are cheating, like they're cheating the system or something as if there isn't like a four lane highway through a national park. But anyways, it, it was just something that we had to address because everybody had the question whether, whichever way you came out on it. I mean, some of these things were built to support carnivore movement. I don't know why we would feel that carnivores are cheating. Nonetheless, we had to look at this question. So the prediction of the prey trap hypothesis is basically you would have a distribution of, of kill sites made by carnivores across the landscape. Um, you know, there's a road in this landscape, but before any fencing or crossing structures were built, right? So anyways, these animals are running around interacting and killing each other, but after the crossing structure and fencing was built, then you've got this funneling effect of, of prey through the underpass. Maybe the carnivores are ambushing them, or maybe it's just sort of corralling animals together into a tighter space. Either way, you're gonna get animal, uh, uh, these prey kill sites would be closer to the fence or closer to the highway following mitigation. So we had a nice uh, design for, for that because people were tracking the location of kill sites before uh, the highway was built just as in unrelated projects. And we could look at the distance from the highway to these kill sites before and after mitigation. And we found, yeah, in two different phases, a 1980s phase and a 1990s phase, if anything, uh, kill sites tended to get slightly farther away from the highway after mitigation than before. So this tells us basically that, prey, that the crossing structures and fencing are not prey traps. But you can see from the pictures that there's still dead animals near the highway. And we looked at the probability of finding one of these carcasses as a function of distance to the highway and other areas across the landscape. And basically predators still kill prey near the crossing structures, but that probability is about the same in other areas of the landscape. So this tells us, the, this is a very satisfying, uh, uh, non-significant uh, statistical finding um, for a scientist to, to encounter, right? Because usually we want to find like, oh, we found a difference or we found effect of X on Y or whatever it is. But in this case, there was no effect. And that's really cool because it says, hey, these structures are not really interrupting or disrupting predator-prey interactions. They're still happening in, the, in a way that we'd expect them to happen or in places that we'd expect them to happen if the highway wasn't there. And I think that's kind of interesting. Yeah, lots of cool interactions picked up by camera. And, you know, this could change. You can imagine some specialist individuals, especially cougars, might pick up on a sheep population or something in an underpass. But what we're talking about here is the big picture, focusing especially on the main predator in the Bow Valley, which was uh, wolves. Okay, so here are the big sort of take home lessons from BAMF before I get into what, what do we want to see in BC. So we need that long term data to understand the effectiveness of our management. This is especially true for large mammals that have long generation times, slow reproductive rates, and have large home ranges. So we want methods to monitor that are robust, right? That are that give us good answers, but they're also relatively uh, cheap to implement. And camera traps are a great technology for doing that. In the Banff case, um, we kind of went across a number of different governments uh, during that time and different interests and priorities within a, a particular electoral cycle. And so we needed partnerships to buffer the uncertainty around funding and agency priorities. And I think that's a really important lesson. It wasn't just government driving this, it was a whole sort of bulk collaboration. Um, again, there was the champion with Tony, but there was other people that were brought on board at different phases to keep this thing going. And that's a really important lesson too. And then we had to communicate broadly about what we were finding. So when uh, I was at the office, it was me who was checking the crossings and um, you know, taking my rake out and changing batteries in the crossing structures. And there was a, another funded position in this project, which was pretty small. And that person's job was to do outreach and education. And I think that was another victory. So it wasn't like a side idea. It was like, you know, 50-50, we're going to have research and we're going to have communication about that research. They are both seen equally. And that included school visits. We put up a, dis a display at the Calgary Zoo. Uh, yeah, it was, I think, a big part of why that project was successful. We learned that fencing, you know, reduces collisions, of course. It also saves wildlife, people, and money. So there's an economic argument from this. 
We learned that crossing structures work, but their effectiveness depends on species or groups within a species, different ages and sexes within a species. And of course, these different design, location, and human use factors that need to be accounted for as well. And then the future, I think, is this idea of um, species interactions. How does the crossing structure influence uh, predator-prey interactions? How does it influence disease spread? I'm going to touch on that on a bit in a bit. Uh, what's the link between crossing structures and the growth of a population? How do we design crossing structures and mitigation for species that don't often encounter roads? Most of the stuff I'm showing you here are from low elevation species that already occur near roads, but other species cross roads just not very often, and we need to design uh, highways in a way that facilitates their movement. So here I'm thinking about uh, things like sheep, goats, uh, wolverines, you know, things that, you know, marmots, um, pika. Uh, there's a lot of different species in different areas. I don't think some of you are thinking, why well, I saw a goat on the road the other day looking salt. Well, yeah, but in a lot of places, they're not near roads. And so thinking big picture here, how do we get animals across roads when we don't have a lot of data on their interactions with roads is a challenge. And always finding cheaper methods uh, to understand road wildlife interactions. Okay, so where do we go from here? Well, one is one idea is how do we prioritize where we want to build uh, mitigation in the future outside of Banff? Like Banff had this very clear mandate, which was great. Like Parks Canada said, okay, if you're gonna if we're gonna build or expand a huge highway through Canada's flagship national park, then that's going to be the best highway in Canada for wildlife. Not every highway has that mandate, or age, transportation agency has that mandate. In fact, very few do. So to prioritize sort of the big picture regional scale, where do we invest our 5 million bucks to make a greener road or a safer road? That's sort of the next level here. So uh, recently uh, in 2020, we published this paper looking at this question for Southern Alberta. So this is the South Saskatchewan uh, regional planning area. So Calgary is up here. And we built a number of connectivity models that sort of emulated where, or simulated where animals are likely to move through this uh, region. And we combine that with data from the RCMP on animal vehicle collisions. And we came up with an index of places that you're likely to hit an animal. And we put these two streams of data together to prioritize alignment. So where is an area where you have a high risk of wildlife vehicle collisions and an area that's important for wildlife movement? And they're not always the same, right? Because you could have an area that's good for wildlife movement, but there's not a lot of traffic on it. So you don't get roadkill showing up in, in the, in the uh, record. So it's seeing the different combinations, the win-win here of human safety and wildlife uh, conservation value uh, in an analysis like this. So the hope here is uh, with these sort of red uh, areas, these prioritized areas, uh, this is where um, wildlife and transportation agency, agencies should take a closer look uh, at funding and supporting wildlife uh, mitigation on highways. So how do we, yeah, why can't we do that in BC? To my knowledge, that hasn't been done in BC. And, you know, there is a lot of highways through some of the best wildlife habitat in the country in British Columbia. We don't have a province-wide plan for where to put our next overpass. We have regional plans. There's great work happening on Highway 3. Uh, there's local localized efforts. Um, but where do we situate the, the next overpass in this great province. And then think about resource roads. Okay, we've got a million kilometers worth of roads in this province. That's a lot. Where do we start dealing with this problem? Just to look at this from a, a road effect zone perspective. So here we are in region eight, south of Kelowna. I'm over here someplace. So lots of roads here. And when you include a 500 meter road effect zone, there isn't much left for wildlife only. And you can see where the protected areas really pop out uh, in a map like this. So I would like people to consider a vision for road ecology in British Columbia, that we are smart and capable enough to make a plan of where we wanna see, where we wanna make a uh, highway safer, and then we're gonna fund it. We're gonna work on a systematic road closure plan or access management plan in sensitive landscapes. And we're gonna make sure that we're promoting the right type of connectivity across highways and not the bad kind. I'm gonna tell you what I mean by that in a second. So thinking of big picture, like where do we put the next overpass? We've got data on collisions. It varies in quality. It's hard to access these data, but we have a rough idea of where some of the collisions are occurring. 
we have a poor idea of where the important areas for connectivity are in the province. So that's one opportunity. We also have provincial uh, road mitigation efforts that are celebrated. So there's been some good work in BC on this. There's a lot of fencing, especially down here in the south. And I think most of the fences in Banff National Park were built by Kelowna-based fencing companies because they're really good at building fences over here for the orchards and all the highway fencing that's already here. So Canada's first overpass was built just outside of Peachland in the Okanagan. There are 20 nine large wildlife overpasses in BC. So there, I don't want to diminish the, the work that's been done already, but to put this in perspective, in Banff National Park, you've got one wildlife crossing structure for every 1.86 kilometers of fencing. So if you had a stretch of 30 kilometers of highway, there'd be 17 crossings on that stretch of highway. In Banff, or I'm sorry, in BC, for every, uh, you have one crossing for every 4.85 kilometers of fencing. So over that same, 30 kilometer stretch, you would have seven crossings. Now we do need to know how many crossing structures is enough, but I just want to put that into context about um, what the priorities of the province look like when it comes to uh, building in infrastructure to support wildlife connectivity. What about road closures and access management? So this has been happening again. So here's a photo uh, on the bottom there shared from uh, Clayton Lamb, who's doing some work with the province and the Tanaha to look at uh, road deactivation in the Kootenays. Um, this is a photo of a, of a access management uh, structure in the Young Main Forest area in the Granby. And we know that, um, yeah, access management is predicted to, predicted to have increased grizzly bear abundance by upwards of 20, 27% in that Kettle Granby area where they did a lot of access management. So that's inspiring, right? And where else should the next Kettle Granby area be? Can we figure out a systematic way of, of rolling that out? And access management comes out a fair bit in different wildlife recovery plans, such as Caribou. Um, there was a very small stretch, 2.3 kilometers on the Fisher Creek Forest Service Road, designed to reduce uh, predator access and, and human access to sensitive caribou range um, as part of the recovery of the Clinsey's the caribou herd. Fortunately, somebody went and undid that deactivation. So they brought in heavy equipment and undeactivated the road. Um, so, I mean, there's a bigger problems here with uh, uh, social support for some of this work, I get it, but we also need to find a way of navigating that uh, uh, different perspective, these different perspectives on what access means and who's gonna benefit people or wildlife or both. Bringing this back to um, Southern BC again, where we're doing work on mule deer. So um, this is one of the, the deer from the Sim Deer Project, the Southern Interior Mule Deer Project that Jesse mentioned earlier. And you can see this map of designated ungulate winter range units in region eight. So here's uh, Kelowna over here, oh, right there, there's the bridge. So each one of these green polygons has a special management, a general area uh, regulation that dictates the type, the type of uh, uh, forestry, forest harvesting that can take place there with the idea that they need to prioritize ungulate winter range. That includes food and snow interception cover and thermal cover to get ungulates through tough winters. Well, here's the proportion of those UWRs, those special areas for, for mule deer that are within 500 meters of a road. So most of them are, you know, within that road effect zone. So they're not uh, as good as they could be. And within that, we need to think more clearly about access management. And there are some access management areas within this, of course, but uh, again, at a more systematic level, how can we think about access management uh, at a region like at this sort of scale when upwards of 80% um, or more, more of these crossing, or sorry, more of these UWRs are, um, have more than 80% sort of influenced or covered by that road effect zone. So lots of room for growth on this file. And I'm just gonna wrap up the idea of a vision for, uh, for connectivity in BC with another example from Banff. So town ungulates, just like in Southern BC, towny deer, towny elk are a problem in Banff. And one of the solutions to this is to uh, block elk from coming into the town, but that would, you know, if we blocked all animals from coming into town or near town, 
it would impede or, or disrupt Parks Canada's uh, other mandate to support carnivore movement and natural predator prey interactions. So to get around that, uh, Banff National Park looked at a few crossing structures that were near town. So we have a herd of elk, an underpass, and the elk are trying to get under the underpass into town. And what they did is a very simple technology, just a rail fence here, right? And when the elk are in town, uh, they'll eventually go under the underpass to the, to the area outside of town. And then the wildlife, uh, the wardens will come out, the biologists will come out and put up these uh, rail posts. And that it's like a, you know, a permeable, semi-permeable permeable membrane that keeps the elk out of town but still allows the carnivores, the, the cougars and wolves to use this crossing structure unimpeded. So simple, but I think pretty innovative technology to think about how we can use uh, infrastructure like crossing structures and highways to be selective and smart about the kind of connectivity that we wanna see in the landscape. And here's the reason why this matters a lot in British Columbia right now. Chronic wasting disease is 50 kilometers away from our borders, okay? That's within the migratory range of some of the deer that we've tracked in southern BC. They've gone from the Kootenays down into Libby, Montana, down to this red dot. Okay, so the animals that are crossing the BC border into Montana or Alberta are getting close to or are in counties with chronic wasting disease, which means it could be coming back through a natural vector of a migratory animal. We need to know where animals are crossing the border and we need to find a way of getting animals across the border that we want to have and blocking the ones that we don't want to have. And that's one of the questions that my student Jake Hubner is looking at. He's looking at uh, four different species of ungulate and how, uh, you know, they're likely movement routes across the US and Alberta border into BC. And then we're going to look at ways that we can use existing highways to sort of funnel or uh, be more selective in connectivity. So not all connectivity is good, when we're talking about things like uh, a terrible disease transmission like chronic wasting disease. Yeah, and then just the last point there, um, if we're gonna do road mitigation, we need to yeah restore, but we need to monitor and then make the data available. That's the priority. So I'll just end with, I don't know if this will work. Nice picture of a grizz using an underpass in Banff. This is early days uh, remote camera work. And a few minutes later, something interesting happens. So pretty cool that people and Grizz can coexist in Banff, that everybody's using the underpass. Um, but what, you didn't, what I didn't want to reveal is what these people are talking about. They knew what this crossing structure was about and why it was important. And I think that's an important uh, piece of the puzzle is making sure that the public, people like you are aware of why roads matter and what we can do about them to make the world better. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Dr. Ford. Uh, appreciate it. I think uh, a bunch of the people's minds are still spinning. Uh, we had a couple of questions which you preemptively covered in your talk. So we'll open it up now for probably about 10 or 15 minutes for uh, people that have questions for Dr. Ford. Please uh, feel free. Go ahead. Here we go. In your opinion, is road deactivation sufficient in reducing the road effect on wildlife, specifically ungulates, or is road reclama reclamation required to reduce the efficiency of predator travel and sight lines, or is it a case of take what you can get? <laughs> well, I don't think we know, but I think it depends on your ungulate. So I think for caribou, for sure, we would want to keep the keep the predators from using the roads uh, as efficiently as they as they can we know that from other work on seismic lines and roads would be no different um it's the scale that that work has to be done at is kind of the big question um for other species 
where you're worried about um, yeah, hunting pressure perhaps, or disturbance from off highway vehicles. And I would look at the access piece and you can imagine why yeah, certain, certain bits of habitat animals are going to get bumped out of um, if there's yeah, loud vehicles around and people making a rocket. So um, I think we just want to be choosy about where those uh, motorized access places are and try to keep them out of uh, areas that we know are uh, important, especially for things like, you know, fawning and, and that summer fattening time that ungulates need. Thanks. Any other questions? I think you've got everybody, their, their minds are still turning. Uh, Adam or Dr. Ford, Region 8, BCWF is partnering with others to investigate reestablishing ungulate migration corridors across Highway 97C. Are you aware of the initiative and are you available for consultation? Totally. Yeah, we've worked with the Okanagan Nation to put in some proposals to fund some of that work. The CINDER project is informing some of that. Um, I think there could be better efforts made to and simple stuff to monitor those crossing structures. Um, some of them are not, uh, you're not allowed to access them. So I think they could open that up to scientists. Um, and then I think there's some spots where there's fencing because it's a pretty handy way of managing cattle uh, to fence uh, an underpass. And I, and I don't know if that's still the case, but some of those things are easy wins if you can get the people involved to, to support the, wor the work that we're doing. So. Yeah, I'm absolutely uh, standing by and thinking deeply about 97C um, on an almost daily basis. Thanks for the question. Okay, thanks, Dr. Ford. So we have one from Dave. How is the project on the connector underpasses that are not being used progressing to move wildlife? Yeah, I think kind of related. Uh, we need to see the data, and we all. And my understanding is we're not monitoring as much of those structures as we should be. So I think that's that's a project. My understanding is that's a project being led by the Okanagan Nation, and uh, maybe we could all uh, get in touch together with them and see where they're at with their monitoring. And I know obviously Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure has cameras up at that overpass. I don't know what their interests or efforts are at the underpasses. Thanks. A uh, question from Colton. Has a mapping exercise like the one used in Alberta to identify hotspots for government agencies to focus on being completed in BC? And how are the Alberta results communicated to government agencies? Okay, so first part of that question, no. Um, the follow-up is we've applied three times to fund that work with some of the same people. and. So it's a work in progress, I guess. I'm optimistic it will be funded. It seems like it's a it's a it's an easy the the, you know, the workflow is fairly straightforward, um, and it seems like an obvious priority to me. It's just finding a match between the people who can support the research and bring the experts together to get it done. The second part of your question was can you remind me, Jesse. It was. Um... And how are the Alberta results communicated to government agencies? Right. Yeah. So the great thing there was government was part of that team. So we brought together, I mean, one of the big challenges with, uh, with road ecology, I guess, where the opportunity is you have transportation people and wildlife people. And if, if you worked with government, sometimes within the same ministry, you don't have people really talking to each other as much as you would expect, let alone across ministries. So one of the benefits of that project is we sat around the table with transportation people and wildlife people and NGOs and researchers and we hashed out this plan we're like what kind of data do we have and we brought in snakes mule deer grizzly bears and we reached out to our um, our network and kind of cobbled together the different data sources that we could find that were the priority for that group and then we went through sort of a, a process by which those experts the people in the room the policy makers and decision makers uh, we're setting priorities and guiding us in that research. So I think it, it was a very clear pipeline from the research to the decision making. And the reason why that project was initiated is uh, the partner that, that I was working with, the Mustakas Institute and Tony was doing a lot of work on Highway 3 in the Crow's Nest Pass on the Alberta side, um, trying to get an underpass built, finding funding to build the underpass, 
did a lot of work. Okay, here's the spot. Here's where the other pass is going to go. Everybody's happy with it. And then the transportation people said, hey, we've got like thousands of kilometers of roads in our management area. Why is this the priority? Like, how do we know? Yes, that sure, that's a good spot for that underpass, but why not somewhere out near Medicine Hat or Lethbridge or Calgary? So that's what spurned our interest in saying like, actually, that's a really good question. How do we compare or how do we prioritize at the scale that matters to you, the people with the budget? And, and I think that's where we need to look at the BC model is, you know, uh, Modi, the transportation people have a different planning region than, than Flint Road, than the wildlife people. And we need to get those overlaid and get all those people in the room together uh, to chat. Just because there's a, a wildlife person in Modi doesn't mean that they're, you know, talking the same or speaking the same language as the wildlife people uh, in the wildlife shop of government. You got a couple of spatially, uh, spatially distinct areas here. Are you aware of any mitigation work being done near Sparwood? Yep. Yeah, there's some good stuff happening there. There's a uh, fence fencing going in and uh, underpass being installed or uh, a bridge a bridge crossing that's being expanded to accommodate wildlife better. That's pretty exciting stuff. Um, you know, First Nations government researchers all coming together on that one. Um, uh, industry too, tech I think is involved in that one. So that's the kind of multi-group partnership that I'm talking about that made Banff work. And I think that's the model of the future. Everybody uses roads. And I think these are easy wins because everybody wants to see a safer road for people and wildlife. And I think we just have to kind of get the get the people informed that this is an option for them to do good. Um, yeah, sorry for the tangent there, but yeah, I am aware. And also I would say that Highway 3 in the Sparwood, Fernie, that whole area at Cranbrook, that's where I think we need to be very choosy about where we put underpasses and the right kind of crossing structures because that's where uh, you know we suspect how, uh, chronic wasting disease is going to be coming through into the province. Okay, another one. Uh, any work done on the island? There have been some great fencing in Mid Island, but the Lake Couch and Highway is a hot spot for elk accidents. Are you tied into any of that? No, I'm not too familiar with that yet. But we have an elk project on the go further up island in Campbell River, um, starting up this summer, and so I guess we'll get a look at some of that, but a little bit further away from the highway. Um, yeah, not too familiar. Okay, uh, maybe you've explained this already, but what do you think the reasons? are for insignificant predator funnel, I guess, near the, um, near the overpass and underpass. Yeah. Why wasn't there a significant effect? Um, I think the way that, especially wolves hunt, it didn't lend themselves to sitting near an underpass waiting for something to come by. So if, if you're a hunter, think of them as it's more of a mule deer program than a white tail program. And so they should be out looking and spending their energy chasing and looking for animals rather than ambushing. And I think that that's probably one reason why. Um, early days and when that fence went in, there was reports of coyotes uh, chasing sheep into the fence. And so Banff put up, Parks Canada put up uh, some green mesh along the fence so that sheep would see it and not kind of avoid it until it was too late. Um, they would kind of keep away from it. But um, yeah, I, I think it's, it's just not it's not a it makes sense to people but it doesn't i don't think it makes sense to the wildlife okay thanks the questions are flowing now uh what process did you use for engaging industry industry and in cooperating yeah um well here's here's one so i, I think i mentioned something about cheaper cheaper I, what I, I was actually referring to was a cheaper crossing structure and one of the things we did just at the end of my time in Banff, you can read about this, it's called, it's uh, sponsored by a group called ARC. And what they did is put out an, uh, they got funding for an engineering competition. So they put out a prize, I, like a prize that's worth, worth it for engineers to come up with a design for a cheap but effective overpass. And they built it um, or they designed it. So I think they got, I don't know, a couple hundred K together. And then a bunch of different firms bid or put forth their design and then engineers chose the best uh, or engineers and wildlife people together chose the best design. Um, from that, the design 
all the designs were available to people to look at and build their own crossing structure. And then there was the winner who got the prize. Now the rub there is just because you invent a crossing structure and it's experimental doesn't mean anybody wants to build it, even if it's cheaper, because who wants to build an experimental anything over a, a huge highway and you know the risk there is not great. So somehow someone has to take the risk to build it and test it. Um, the designs that people are or have used uh, for crossing structures have been tested on, on other things like bridges. So they know that they work and they're safe and the liability is there for them to do that. These experimental and cheaper designs for wildlife specifically are um, something that has to be worked out. Thanks. Um, do you know if wildlife corridors are as effective with their current spacing with small animals with smaller rangers or as they are with the large ones? Yeah, so oddly, um, in connectivity science, we don't have a clear answer on how much connectivity is enough. It sounds strange. So you can have connectivity that promotes gene flow, in which case you don't need that many animals to cross the road. Um, so I say that because the more crossing structures you have, the more animals are going to cross the road. Um, so, uh, so do you need a crossing structure for every squirrel home range to do the job of, of making that road better for squirrels like I don't I don't know um, again the the culverts work pretty well and and in the summer they work well we did a winter study but yeah um, the spacing that I referred to was for the for the larger animals and and then we have within a home range you know these different designs for for different groups within a population. So it would be a good idea to have more than one crossing structure to minimize encounters with animals that you don't want to encounter each other in a tight space, like, uh, you know, a boar grizzly and, and some cubs. Okay, thanks. Uh, have you made this presentation to, or has it been shared with the BC Ministry of Transportation? No, is that a good idea? We can make that connection. <laughs> Let's do it. We'll follow up on that one. Uh, can you make available more info, i.e. specific studies about your animal movement data matching with uh, wildlife vehicle collision risk? And also, Adam, for your information, I posted your Google, Google Scholar website. So I imagine a lot of that's open source. Yeah, so where do animals move versus where are the collisions? I think, yeah. We have some control over the animal movement data, being people that are funding the collection and, and distribution of colors and tracking. We have less control over the, the wildlife collision data. And it's, yeah, I'm working on, on collecting it and I've heard mixed reports on its quality. I think a lot of stuff is missed. Um, you know, we've got contractors out there collecting roadkill and it's not clear what priority um you know that kind of systematic collection is for them so it, yeah if there was ever an interest in sort of a citizen science approach to road kill data collection that would be good a recent study published late last year or maybe earlier this year by Mustak the Mustakis institute again found that there's an under reporting of collisions by upwards of 2.8 times so for every carcass you find there's almost three that you don't find because um, they get bonked and they're in the bushes and you don't see it from the roadside survey. So there's lots of lots of missing data out there. Um, so I just say, yeah, I wish I had better access to the collision data. Um, and then, yeah, we'll have some from the Cindir project where our, our monitor gear are hit and that will help a little bit too. Uh, here's a, this will be an interesting question. Interested in Todsy or boreal caribou use of these crossing structures, bearing ground caribou, equo, seem to be less stressed over highways that look like eskers. Curious about Todsy as we have a new highway being built here in the NWT in key Todsy habitat and if a wildlife crossing structure may mitigate any potential future concerns identified through the required monitoring programs of Todsy behavior. Is that from Angus? Uh, that is from Stuart, I believe. Okay, Stuart, why don't you follow up on an email, but uh, 
I have a student incoming to the lab who's working on that question, stress effects and caribou, maybe you know him. Um, he's wrapping that up for his master's with Chris Johnson at UMBC and will be coming to our group to work on Roswell elk on the island. So they'll catch him at a time before we shift all of his attention to, to elk. Um, so we can put you in touch to figure out what's going on there. Great. Uh, you have talked about a comparative analysis between under and overpasses in one area. I've requested Modi to compare two S curves along a heavily used mine road, um, have sent them GPS coordinates also. How would you suggest this comparison should proceed? You sent them, so you're concerned about a stretch of road and you're wondering if there should be an overpass or an underpass built on it. Is that how you interpret that question, Justin? I think so, yeah. I think there's two stretches of, of heavily used road, essentially. Right. And, and I think they will want to know um, underpass, overpass. Right. And, and you know, kind of where you focus it. Yeah, I would say, um, I would think about uh, overpasses as something probably for the highways, for, for big roads, for, you know, four lane roads. Um, and then within, yeah, outside of that, I think there's an engineering question to it. So if even if it's a hotspot for crossing, sometimes engineers can't build the kind of structure that wildlife people might want, and it can go either way. We've been in projects where we proposed underpasses and engineers say we can't dig into the water table right there, so they built an overpass. Um, there might be a natural cut or embankment that would make one of those designs better than the other. Um, but I think the big picture is if you fence it and put even a box culvert, you'll get animals using it. Um, there might be a better structure, but just those box culverts that they use for cows, like that, that can be enough, especially if you keep people out of it and it's fenced. Okay, a uh, question from the Granby. This is with regards to closed roads and access. Is it effective from a wildlife ecology perspective? Yeah, there was a predicted bump in 27% of 27% for that grizzly bear population with access management. Um, parts of that design could be more rigorous. So if we were to do that again, we would have a good sense of what the population was like before access management went in. Um, so this is something that, yeah, we're talking about with the deer project is how do we roll out restoration in a, in a like access management, like prescribed fires <clears throat> at a scale where we actually expect to see a bump in the wildlife population, not a postage stamp. So not like a couple kilometers worth of roads, but like a watershed. Um, that's the kind of thing, that's the kind of skill that I think we need to think about. And um, I know in some areas are, you know, deactivating roads and, and, and doing access management, but um, I don't think we're really at the scale um, to look at the population response. We can, we can predict it with some, some models like I showed you, but we really wanna get, here's what the population is like before the access management and here's what happened after. And that's the only way we're gonna get at it. And we, we need to get uh, everybody on board in industry, you know, uh, the Federation and the ENGO sector and government to all say like, let's do this and do it right. And we'll do it in 10 different watersheds across BC We'll measure things before and we'll compare it to things in nearby watersheds where we didn't do this access management that will give us the answers and it will give us the cost that's the key too is a lot of these things will eventually grow more animals um, how many more animals and at what at what cost is i think what will carry the conversation and we don't have the data to have that grown-up conversation yet Okay, uh, this is a really, this is extremely pertinent. Um, can you comment on mechanisms other than fencing and under overpass <clears throat> preventing wildlife collisions, thinking of the Alaska Highway where we have expansive, you know, highways that last hundreds of kilometers and lots of collisions, especially in the fall and winter. Can we think of other ways of keeping animals off the road? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Where, where fencing and overpass and underpasses are gonna be cost prohibitive. Right. Yeah, the big one, the big one, one of the big ones is speed. So you'll see in Kootenai National Park, the speed limit's 90. And that's typically, that's for wildlife. Um, you go up to 110 and, it, and the risk increases a fair bit. Um, 
I would guess the time of day, you know, uh, speed limits by time of day maybe is another way to think about it. But also, I mean, this is kind of a bit sci-fi, but not too much, is people are talking about wildlife mitigation being outdated already because of the AI technology that's coming on board for vehicles. So they're teaching cars how not to run over people. They're going to teach them how to not run over uh, deer and elk and moose. Um, and, and with that, you'll basically have your highway wildlife mitigation built into your car. Um, and so I think that's an exciting prospect. And I'd love to say that it's, yeah, like, or not, I wouldn't love to say. Uh, you can imagine why that's something that would happen in 20 years, but it may be closer than that. So, um, yeah, we'll, we'll see. There's other technologies that, I, again, are you know, cheaper than overpasses and fencing, like wildlife detection systems. So it's like a string of infrared, you break the infrared beam, lights go on, or it, there's a variable message. So it tells, it's not just a fixed sign that says deer crossing and then you never see a deer. It says there's a deer here when there's a deer there. So you know how to adjust your behavior uh, as a driver. And so those technologies are out there too. And there's one in the, in the Kootenays that has been trialed, um, but you don't see it very often and probably for a reason. Okay, and uh, just uh, I'll line this other question up there. There's a question that ties into what you just mentioned. Do we have any data on the effectivity of the wildlife detection and warning systems installed recently on some of BC's highways? Yeah, I, I've heard a mixed mixed bag. So we, I guess we'd have to go to the report authors for that one. Um, and then the other one on that last comment around the Alaska Highway, I know we've had some site-specific issues. I'm thinking of Roy Ray's work on Lex for moose. Yeah. And also goats and sheep that stand on the highway and lick salt off where, you know, you can either um, move the licks, bury the licks or put salt off of the highway to keep the animals off. Yeah, that's a good point too. that intercept feeding. I know that group WTI there on the slide has tried um, sort of wildlife friendly de-icing agents that don't attract animals to the road as well. Great. Uh, what's the spatial variability and resolution of the map with the red dots? <laughs> Ooh, red dots. I'm guessing the Alberta map of the priorities, uh, the priority stretches, red dots. Oh. I use red a fair bit. There's some red dots. This one? No, squares. This one I was thinking. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Yeah, you can see the scale on the bottom left. Um, what's the, so this study was 79,000 kilometers of roads, sorry, 7,900 kilometers worth of roads and 84,000 square kilometers of study area. So imagine, yeah, a couple of WMUs in BC to get that started. But the idea here is we would template this in South Saskatchewan and roll it across the province. Um, Turns out there's differences in opinion among different regional managers and people, yeah, just because you do it for government in one region doesn't mean everybody wants to see that in their, in their fiefdom. Consistently inconsistent, got it. Uh, has any of the data from the Alberta Wildlife Watch app been used in any of the, uh, any research yet? Yeah, it's being used on the, on the down here and the crow's nest pass to put that structure in. And also that um, that study I was mentioning about the detection, the detection rate of carcasses. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, we'll get just a couple more questions in. We'll cut it off around 830. Have any, uh, have types of fences been looking at, looked at in terms of risk of entanglement? Hmm. Yeah. I mean, I, I, we, we hear about wildlife friendly fencing, but with respect to road mitigation, I haven't heard too much. It's most of the stuff I've seen pretty standard is that eight foot high page wire fencing. So there's different designs to make it more durable, but not from an entanglement perspective. It seems pretty solid in that respect, but maybe other people have seen otherwise. I think the way it's maintained is a big part of it. So Parks Canada is on it. Like if there's a tree that falls on that fence, they're on it because animals get out. Um, so, and I, yeah, I see a lot of dilapidated orchard fences around here. And so that could, that could lead to an entanglement issue that we may not see in Banff. 
Awesome. Uh, what about data on number of wildlife killed in Kootenai by, region by rail? Have you spent any time with that? Uh, not much on the rail piece, um, but I've yeah, heard a bit about it. Um, so I think that's another one of those interesting, yeah, jurisdictional breakdowns. Like who's who's watching that? Uh, one, you don't have the human safety issue with the rail kills. So you almost have to look at animals that are monitored for another study and see what the rates of rail kill are. Yeah, and there's a government database where it's all tracked. Um, I think it's susceptible to the same issues that the uh, ICBC database is. Uh, yeah, fair bit of underreporting when you when you explode an animal on the end of a yeah. locomotive. Uh, is there any difference between known road kills occurring on highways versus resource roads? Yeah, we don't hear much about road kill on resource roads, to be honest. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know the state of that uh, that question really. Yeah, I, I you know because you need reporting as well then too. Yeah, there's the reporting issue, and then I mean we've all probably all seen people going down resource roads fast enough that they will hit something, um, but uh, but with the traffic volume being typically so much lower, yeah, I don't I don't know. Okay, uh, it's eight thirty one, so. Dr. Ford, thank you very much for your time. This was awesome. Lots of questions, people from all over the province and, and all over Canada too, asking questions about road ecology. So that's great. Really appreciate your insight. And I think there's some people that are looking to do some kind of boots on the ground work related to road ecology. Uh, so I'd really like to thank you for your time. I'd like to thank Brian and Josie for arranging this with the BCWF, our office. Um, and then I, uh, just want to give a quick plug. Uh, we weren't going to have any webinars in July, but we have one a last minute uh, webinar because we couldn't do it in 2022 or any more of 2021. Uh, this one's going to be really interesting. Uh, it's The title is Environmental Induced Epigenetic Transgenerational Inheritance, Hatchery Impacts on Steelhead Trout Populations. Um, very salient for what we're going to be dealing with here in BC as we have our endangered uh, interior Fraser steelhead. It's going to be presented by Dr. Michael Skinner from the University of Washington. So that one will be July 15th, uh, same time, same place. I would highly recommend everyone tunes in to that one. Uh, it's going to be super valuable and uh, hopefully, you know, the weather isn't quite as warm then either. So again, thanks everyone for tuning in. It's 832. That's enough of everyone's night. I hope you're all staying cool. And please keep in mind with these webinars, the objective here is to give you information so that you can advocate on behalf of fish, wildlife, and habitat. If you learn all this cool stuff and you walk away and you don't share it to anybody, with anybody, it doesn't do uh, fish, wildlife, and habitat any good. So thanks for tuning in. Hopefully see you on July 15th and have a good night.